Thank you very much, Mark. I am honored to speak here at this forum today. And I'm thankful to the ICD for giving me this opportunity and creating this uh, platform for multicultural and interdisciplinary intellectual exchange. Um, as he said, my topic today will look at, uh, my paper looked at compliance and implementation of human rights treaties. And the paper basically evaluates the extent to which um, international law, specifically treaties, um, serve as a tool for protection of human rights. And the relevance of this topic today, um, we're literally a few days away from witnessing the signing of the SDGs, wherein some, uh, some of the goals of the SDGs outlined are reinforcing basic human rights that are present in multiple other human rights treaties. And to give you just a small snapshot of this, um, for, the, for example, the first SDG is to end poverty. The second SDG is to end hunger um, and achieve human sec uh, uh, food security. In the International Convention of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Article 11 states that state parties to the present covenant um, recognize the right of everyone to an adequate um, standard of living for himself and his family, including adequate food, clothing, housing, and the continuous improvement of living conditions. Um, SDG number three, which is to ensure health, um, we can see that is secured in um, also the Convention of Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. Article 12 specifically um, gives everyone the right to an enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Um, SDG number five, women's rights and empowering um, women and girls. We can see the uh, Convention on um, Against the Discrimination of Women, the CEDA, recognizes that there's an extensive um, discrimination against women existing and it emphasizes that such discrimination violates um, the principles of rights and respect for human dignity. Um, this is just to give you a small snapshot. I can go on on this, but in the interest of time, um, I just wanted to make a connection between SDGs and human rights. They're very closely related and essentially interchangeable. So the SDGs are not um, introducing new ideas, but basically reinforcing old ones. Um, the topic of implementation of human rights it also exists in the SDGs, which is something that um, makes these commitments uh, different from the MDGs. Um, under SDG number 17, it basically um, says that it's, it's to strengthen the, the means of implementation and to revitalize the global partnership of sustain for sustainable development. Um, so moving on to talk about the implementation of human um, of, treat, of human rights in the human rights treaties. First, I'll give you an overview of the human rights system and how it works. I know we're here from different um, educational backgrounds and you might not understand really what human rights law and how it's enfor um, the enforcement mechanism. Um, human rights basically is a system of reciprocity um, among um, sovereign states and treaties and agreements are signed pacta sub savanda, meaning that they're signed in good faith and that states will honor these um, agreements because they're coming with the best intentions. Um, under the sources of international law, which are under um, Article 38.1 of the International Court of Justice Statute, it lists the sources there and treaties, customs, general principles, um, teachings and opinions of highly qualified publicists are, um, treaties themselves are the highest source of, uh, source of law um, for human rights. In human rights law, there are two systems, charter-based um, systems and um, treaty-based systems. The charter which falls under the UN Charter. Um, we see the, also the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, gives you some uh, obligations of human rights. And um, under the treaty-based system, there's about nine of them which range from CEDA um, to the Convention Against Torture, uh, disc uh, Racial Discrimination, Rights of the Child, Refugee Rights, Migrant, uh, mig migrant Workers, um, just to name a few. Um, and within these um, treaties, they create their own enforcement mechanisms, which are uh, committees, and they're set up by the treaties themselves to monitor compliance through a number of procedures. Um, just to name a few, there's the self-reporting mechanism where states themselves, on a periodic basis, report to these committees based on what they've done in their countries to secure human rights and what they're doing to fulfill their obligations. But we see that under the uh, Universal Periodic Review, according to the Human Rights Committee, the Universal Periodic Review system um, is riddled with problems. States are delinquent in their submissions uh, of these reports, and their participation is not always consistent. Uh, another um, uh, aspect of um, 
reinforcing these. We have the interstate complaints where one state will, you know, call out another state and say you're not um, actually fulfilling your obligations. But this is very, this is uncommon and very rare for one state to um, call out another state on their practices. Um, this type of monitoring relies on the name and shame uh, mechanism to improve practices, but we can see it's like rarely used. Uh, lastly, there's a, uh, not lastly, there's an optional protocol which allows individuals to submit complaints to um, these committees based on violations that they have faced in their country. Uh, then there's the special procedures where special rapporteurs are assigned to different issues, either on a thematic basis or a country-based um, issue. So we have the special rapporteur on torture, who is uh, Mr. Juan Mendez. Um, he reports on torture issues generally around the world. And then the country-specific, for example, the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights of Cambodia, who is Mrs. Uh, uh, Rona Smith. These committees' um, procedures rec provide um, recommendations. They, they do not uh, have an enforcement mechanism. So they just tell states, okay, this is how you can improve, you can imp imp implement these uh, measures, and that will reduce your uh, systemic uh, violations of human rights. Um, there is no world court, there is no sword. Um, Thomas Hobbes likes to use this word, there is no sword to put a guarantee on implementation. Hence why, along with the rise of treaties, uh, treaty bodies and monitoring human rights violations, there is also a corresponding right, rise in the violation and denial of basic human rights by states. All, um, all you have to do is basically turn on the news or you know, look at the newspaper to see how much violations of human rights are repeated in the daily news cycle. Um, Justin Collin, who is a scholar in human rights, argues that despite the claims of a new stand of intolerance for human uh, misery and human atrocities, nothing has changed to indicate that they are taken any more seriously by powerful nations. Um, Professor Anna Hathaway at uh, Yale Law, she conducted a study assessing the effects of human rights treaty ratification on human rights compliance in 166 nations over a 40-year period in five specific areas, genocide, torture, fair trial, civil liberties, and political representation of women. The study basically concluded that ratification of human rights has little effect on state practice. Um, it may seem that um, signing um, treaties and ratifying them do not pressure states into observing these obligations, but rather offsets their, this pressure. It may seem that states um, are signing symbolically with no intention to implement. States can benefit from this cheap talk and that shields their reputation from international criticism for ignoring international treaties. Um, we can only hope that the adoption of the SDGs in the coming days will be implemented fully um, by 2030 following the poor report card of the MDGs or uh, as we see um, these human rights treaties monitoring systems. If it is any indication of what is to come, we can look at um, the Financing for Development meeting that was held in Addis Ababa a couple of months ago, and Ambassador Tevi yesterday mentioned this. Um, heads of states were supposed to come to Addis Ababa to sign the Addis Ababa Accord, which would be a binding um, document. However, coming out of Addis Ababa, we look, they had the Addis Ababa Ad Action Agenda, which is basically uh, sets out just commitments. Um, so this rubric behind the SDGs in terms of financing, um, capacity building, technology, pro um, in provi providing technology to you know different countries in order for them to allow to help them to try to enforce these SDGs um, is not enforceable. Um, yesterday, Mr. Creighton was talking about good intentions, or having the best intentions in terms of aid and um, development. Um, although best intentions are you know only said, um, the most important thing is honoring your commitment. Um, that's what matters at the end of the day. Sorry, but I digress. Back to my actual paper. These findings, for example, in um, Professor Hathaway's, raise the question as to whether human rights law the, and the regime of human rights law is at all effective in protecting um, human rights. Um, also, whether the lack of adherence to human rights obligations indicates that the normative values of these treaties are meaning, meaningless to states. Um, the challenge faced in the human rights um, regime is how to ensure that states comply once they ratify these um, treaties. So although they can be persuaded to, um, to sign these treaties, they are rarely compl um, compelled. Um, the Under Secretary of Communications yesterday was saying that basically her campaign was to get the word out there, to get the SDGs out there. So it's all in your face. It's like there's this hula baloo, there's this big hooray. 
uh, on t for signing. So how can states, after all that, if it's in everybody's mouth, how can they not sign? So there's this pressure that you can persuade them to sign, but at the, at the end of the day, it is the implementation mechanism and um, compelling states to sign. Um, so rational theorists, they believe that coercion, not persuasion, as a social force is the best mechanism to influence state behavior. Therefore, one state's practice essentially influences the other states. So the current system is indeed weak. However, I do not believe, and this is what I argue in the paper, it is time to abandon the treaty-based system. Um, I argue in the paper that enhancing monitoring and enforcement mechanisms to increase accountability for violations should strengthen the human rights um, regime. And in as much as there's negative things to say about um, human rights, there's also the good. International human rights law has brought incalculable and indirect benefits for rights protection. Um, treaties play a crucial role in the creation of human rights law. And uh, Ban Ki-moon, he notes that the treaty bodies stand at the heart of the international human rights protection system as engines translating universal norms in social justice and individual well-being. So this brings me to my concluding remarks of how we can move forward and what um, uh, basically recommendations for strengthening the human rights rubric. Um, one, there's monitoring states' behavior to ensure that states are integrating these treaty obligations to national laws. And pr um, once they're in your national laws, then your legislature can then take its course of action where um, you can bring violations to your national courts or to the regional systems because relying on states alone is, does not suffice. Um, we can also uh, bring in non-state actors, for example, NGOs and individuals like us can do a lot and they're having a lot of power um, to report violations and um, basically investigate and expose um, and denounce violations that are happening um, within the state system. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its preamble itself says that every individual and every organ of society has a right, ha, is able to promote and respect the human rights system. So we all have a part to play and not only look at the human rights system as an international platform only where um, states are actors, but individuals and non-state actors can also play a part in enforcing um, human rights um, um, treaties. Um, secondly, the regional courts and um, the national courts, as I said, once these laws are implemented into the national systems, then these um, legislatures can take a um, natural course of action. Alrighty, then. Um, I only have one more thing to say. The tr these trust, we also have trust indicators, which are basically a quantitative tool using social and economic data that cuts across social and um, social sciences and law to monitor human rights. Um, it's an audit system, and when used correctly, has um, can monitor compliance of human rights obligations, measure progress, and impact the policy changes of human rights. To leave you with a quote um, from um, Douglas Cassell, he says this, and I really like it. Um, he says, international human rights law is a strand woven through the length of a rope. It is the main value, is the, its main value is not how much right protection can pull a single strand, but how it strengthens the entire role, the entire rope. So that is my presentation, my paper. I hope you all read it. Thank you very much.